Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Cindy Cordova, and I am a Senior Assistant Director within the Board of Admissions at Boston College. And we want to welcome you to this Get to Know BC series, today featuring the Carroll School of Management. What we're going to do for today is try to incorporate as much information as we can about the Carroll School of Management. And for that, I've brought two incredible leaders within the school to tell you more about it. And after their introductions and their, and their PowerPoint, we're going to try to incorporate the questions that you submitted ahead of time into this presentation. You also have time to ask us questions live through the Q&A feature that is available through Zoom. If you just look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A feature on there and you can type in your questions in that box. Now this webinar is being recorded so you can reference it at any point. And again, we would like to welcome you to the class of 2024. Welcome to Boston College and to our community here. We are so excited to have you and family members, guardians who are joining us today. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers to let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Boston College and the Carroll School of Management. My name's Amy Lacombe, and I'm the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Curriculum here in the Carroll School. I kind of coordinate and oversee the first year experience within the Carroll School and the Portico program, which you'll hear about in a little bit. I'm a Boston College graduate. I, I, I am a graduate of CSUN myself. I was an accounting major, started in public accounting, and then did a little pivot to education. Came back to Boston College in 1996 and have been in the Carroll School in a, a couple of different roles of teaching and administration since 2000. I'm very proud to be here and, and honored to be in front of you. I'm gonna pass it over now and to my boss, my dear friend, and our leader of, of the Undergraduate Business School, Ethan Sullivan. Thanks so much, Amy, and welcome. Congratulations, everybody. It's hard to believe, but 30 years ago at this time, I was um, an admitted Eagle. Uh, it's graduated from Boston College in 1994 and was in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. I was a philosophy and English major over there and uh, came back to BC in 2001 and have been working in the Carroll School since 2008. And it's a fantastic place and, and we're super excited to tell you a little bit more about it. And specifically, our agenda is going to focus on what Amy and I feel makes Boston College and the Carroll School special. And you know, we've got over 50 years of, of combined experience here at Boston College. So we know the place pretty well. And we're going to focus on a few things that, that we think make it special. And these are the three things, ever to excel, men and women for others, and cure personalis. They're mottos that you'll hear at Boston College quite a bit. But they're not just mottos. They're not just words or platitudes. They're, they're lived values. So we're going to talk about some of, our program, some of our programs through that framework. So first, ever to excel. Ever to excel is university motto and it comes from a line in Homer's Iliad and I think it it kind of motivates all of us students faculty staff it motivates us every day to to be the best we can be and on the screen you can see a few ways that, that that's demonstrated by our faculty and our students who when you really boil it down to what makes Boston College special I think it's the students the the incredible bright caring passionate students we have and our faculty. Our faculty were recently ranked number one in the nation for teaching by Poets and Quants. Um, earlier this year, they were ranked number 20 in the world in terms of research output. And 20 in the world, when you think about the world, you think about 5,000 business schools across the world. So being number 20, we're very proud of that. Um, we're tied with the Tuck School at Dartmouth, as, as well as uh, Michigan's Ross. We're just a bit ahead of them. And um, we're right behind um, Cornell. So we're in great company there and very proud of where we stand there. Our students do incredibly well here. One way that that's demonstrated is that you know, upon grad with, within three months of graduation, 94% of our most recent graduating class was employed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but for now, let's, let's continue to talk about how we excel in the classroom with our curriculum, and I'm gonna turn it back to Amy. Thanks, Ethan. So we're very fortunate that, even though we're a business school, we're situated in a liberal arts university. All graduates of Boston College, regardless of what school they're in, will have to complete the university core. 
And I will say this, as Ethan mentioned, we've both been here for quite a bit of time. There have been such great innovations in the last 10 to 15 years, not only in the business school with our curriculum that you're here about, but also at the university level. For many years, it was, it was unchanged, and, and we'll talk about this, but everyone at Boston College, all 2250, will have, have to complete the university core. And we think it's very, very important that business school students have a broad education that can, the complex world that we live in today needs people to be able to think critically and, and pull from multiple different areas and not just one very concentrated area. So the university core, everyone will take a full year of philosophy, theology, a semester of writing, a semester of literature, a year of history, a year of natural science, a semester of fine arts, a year of social science, which includes economics, math, and cultural diversity. The good part is, and, and I, we really want you to look at this when it comes home as a packet, the university has invested in the last 10 years in what's called complex problems and enduring questions. And they are where two different departments team up and usually it meets multiple core. It's a six credit class and it's only for the freshman class. So take some time when you get that home and look through that packet because it's really important if there's something of interest in there that you um, pursue that like while you're at Boston College. All graduates of the Carroll School will take will register for five, three, or four credit classes. Most of the classes are three credits. There's a few ex exceptions that are four credits, but everyone will graduate with 120 credits at a minimum. So that's on average 15 credits a semester, 30 credits for the year. And that breaks down to five, three credit classes. We're in the traditional, obviously, semester mode. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Ethan to talk a little bit about the, the Carroll School core. Great, thanks Amy. So in addition to the university core that, that Amy just talked about, we also have our Carroll School, our management core. And these are 12 courses that all management students take. And in a way, think of it as your major, right? All Carroll School students will graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Management. And these 12 courses are the courses you'll take for that. A portico, which you'll hear a bit more about from Amy, is taught in the first semester. All Carroll School students take that in the first semester. Uh, business stats and digital technology are the other two freshman level courses. The others can be done in various years, in various sequences, and we'll go over that in full detail um, at orientation. But uh, these are the courses that students take. They're typically taken through the junior year with the exception of strategic management, which tends to be a senior year course, kind of the capstone course of the management core. In addition to the core, our students all have to take at least 12 credits of electives above and beyond the university core, above and beyond the management core um, from the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. So these can be electives that, that you're just dabbling in areas of interest. They can turn into minors, they can turn into majors. Um, but you know, we really want our students to be what our dean calls T-shaped thinkers, T-shaped people. And so, you know, you want to have that, that bar across the top, that, that T-bar, that you're able to think broadly across a lot of different areas, hence the liberal arts, hence the university core. But we also want to have that, that line, that, that vertical line, where you're developing some expertise and some content knowledge in a business discipline. And one way that that's done is through your concentration. So I'm going to turn it back to Amy and she's gonna talk a little bit more about the concentrations at the Carroll School. Thanks, Ethan. As Ethan mentioned, you'll, everyone will graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Management. And then we, we ask within the Carroll School that you pick one, no more than two concentrations within the Carroll School. And the concentration, as Ethan mentioned, is the deep dive into a, content, is into a particular content area. Here are the concentrations offered at Boston College. Accounting, accounting for finance and consulting is a brand new one. Economics, finance, information systems, as you can see, management and leadership, marketing, operations, management, and a brand new one that's just became a concentration and not a co-concentration and a very popular one is business analytics. We also have two co-concentrations that go along with one of those primary concentrations. All concentrations are four or five classes. And again, as Ethan mentioned, that's the vertical line, the deep dive into particular content or area. Now, there's a, a, if you're interested in accounting, there's certain state regulations, you would actually end up taking more than the five for the concentration to graduate. But that's the, they, we do a really good job in the accounting department of advising people 
the students towards that direction to whatever the state requirements are. But as far as getting your degree from Boston College, you get a BS in management and then you pick at least one concentration, no more than two. And we really hope that you, again, take advantage of the T-shaped thinking and major or minor outside of the Carroll School. And we, in fact, incentivize that. If you so choose to decide to major outside of the Carroll School, we will reduce, going back here, we will reduce the management core by two classes. If you decide to minor outside of the Carroll School, we will reduce this by one class. Every, everyone has to take Portico, business statistics, and financial accounting, but you can reduce one of those other ones if you choose to major or minor outside. Again, incentivizing you to make sure that you are able to do all that you want to do at Boston College, as well as be a business student. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Ethan to really talk about men and women for others. Thanks, Amy. So men and women for others is another motto that you'll hear quite a bit at Boston College. It's actually not distinct to Boston College. It, it's, it comes from the Jesuit order and um, the Jesuit Superior General came up with this quote in, in an address he gave some years ago. But at Boston College, I think men and women for others is, is so important. You'll, you'll hear students reference it all the time. And I think it speaks to the, the service and the call to social justice that our students have. So, you know, we have various ways where, where our students are kind of called to serve others that we'll talk about. And, you know, one thing that I, that I love hearing from students is this idea that they want to do well and do good, right? They, they want to do well. They, they want to get the jobs they want to get. And at the same time, they, they want to do good. They want to do it in ethical ways. They, they want to have a lot of character. And, and, it's, and it's great to see that, we get those students that come to BC, and then we can continue to have to work in dialogue about that. And um, you know, it's one of the hallmarks of a Boston College education, I think. So there are different ways that we do this. Uh, Portico, through our faculty, peers, alumni, and student organizations. And first, Amy is going to talk a bit more about Portico. Kind of a unique title. Uh, our illustrious senior dean who, who retired a year ago kind of came up with it, Portico and Entranceway. Portico is a first semester required course of all Carroll School students. So last year we had 567 in the freshman class, the class of 2023. All freshmen coming in in the fall semester hit the ground running and they take Portico. So as I mentioned before, you'll end up taking five, three or four credit classes in the fall. One of them will be Portico if, you're, if you choose to come to Boston College. The Portico has a wonderful, it's course-based advising. I'll get into a lot of the details, but one of the best parts about Portico is that the classes are 19 students or less. There's a full-time faculty member who then is your academic advisor, and it has two senior teaching assistants in the class to help with the transition to Boston College and just the transition to college in general. Portico meets twice a week with your Portico instructor, and then on Monday nights, there's a plenary session. And this, is, this picture here is an example of one of the plenary sessions. This is Dan Price, CEO of Gravity Payments. He was on 60 Minutes. We pair up with the Winston Center for Ethics and Leadership and bring in a, a, a hallmark speaker every year um, to address um, um, the freshman class on a Monday night. This past year, we had Tyler Schultz, the whistleblower from Theranos, come and speak. Um, again, to, to the in Robsham Theater, it was a wonderful, wonderful talk and the students could really relate. Dan Price, the CEO of Gravity Payments, um, is a CEO in Seattle and realized that his employees were not making a living wage, livable wage. So he raised everyone's salary to a minimum of $70,000 and cut his salary and the employee retention um, is, has improved. It's, it's, been a, it's been a good business decision, but also an emotional one, one that he feels very proud of. So these, as Ethan mentioned, we're in Portico, we really stress, we look at topics like globalization, capitalism, um, technology, and the tensions that are underlying all of those, and then help them to try to figure out the type of business person they want to become. We're very proud of it. Um, it, it just sets, uh, it, it really sets us apart. We're very proud that we're a Jesuit business school and not just a business school. And I think that this is a, uh, an important message to get off the ground and, and it's a small class and the portico faculty as i mentioned are their academic advisors i'll get into it in a little bit uh, later in the presentation but also know that if you choose boston college your portico faculty will be on zoom with you in june and july about registration so we'll get into that in a little bit 
but I'll turn it back over to Ethan to talk a little bit more about the um, faculty here and how they really are dedicated to you. Yes, without a doubt they are. So I think there's a reason our faculty are, are the number one ranked faculty in terms of teaching. And it's obviously because of their content knowledge and their acumen in the classroom. But I think even more so it's because they care. They care so much about the students. Um, I, you know, I, I bet if you think back to your own greatest teachers, whether it's through high school or for the parents in the audience and your own college experiences, and you think about this, the, those that made the biggest impact, it's not always that mass lecture or that English discussion that you remember. It's probably more about who they were and how much they cared about you and for you. And, and I think that's so evident in our faculty. I've, I've been very fortunate to work for some incredible um, institutions of higher education. I've been at BU, I've been at New York University, I've been at Harvard, and I can say easily that our faculty are the most dedicated faculty that I've seen. Their doors are open, they want to talk to students, they want to get to know students, uh, and, and they're just incredible as a faculty. Here's a few pictures there of some programs. We have a program called Take Your Prof Home for Dinner, and we fund students to be able to you know, buy some groceries, we'll, we'll buy them the food, and they'll prepare it and invite a faculty member to their on-campus apartment. Um, there's faculty above and beyond their teaching, they're advising student groups, they're, they're, they're coaching students on different competitions that they're doing. Um, they're just so very involved in the everyday life of our students. And honestly, I, I can't think of a better example of men and women for others than Carroll School faculty. Um, so we do have some other great examples too, and I'm gonna pass it back to Amy to talk about peer mentoring in the Carroll School. I think one thing that has stunned me every single year is how dedicated our students are to helping other students. There's so many different ways, but our students apply to volunteer to help others. Like there's more, there's more people wanting to help. An example is the Portico teaching assistant. People don't even know if it's paid or for credit or whatever. And we had something like 160 applications for 60 spots. That means, you know, there's almost three times the number that want to just give back because they had such a good experience. So the teaching assistants in Portico, there are teaching assistants in business statistics, there are tutoring, tutors in accounting and stats and operations. There, we also have a peer advisor program that is run out of our dean's office where in the, the circle in the middle are the peer advisors where they're coached and trained and they help with resume critiques, interview skills, um, class course advising. I, I can't say enough, like the students here are the most generous and the most giving students I've ever met. And it may stem from the fact that we don't have fraternities and sororities on campus. And, and our students seem, seem, seem to find community through classes and extracurricular activities. The other act, activity I wanted to talk about is student organizations. These are the ones that are just within the Carroll School. But I would say, and Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong, that most students at Boston College, when they graduate, it's, it's the student organization, whether it's a dance group, a culture club, um, women in business, they find an organization that they devote their life to, APA, Appalachia Volunteers, they devote their extracurricular time to. And really, they learn the most important sk skill in leadership is being a servant leader. They come in wanting to help, and here are some opportunities. And all these clubs up here have a mentoring program where seniors are paired with freshmen to help coach them along the way. All of the um, clubs and activities um, host they're the bridge between the, the classroom and the, the real world, and they, they host speakers and events and all of that. And every Sunday night at eight o'clock, all Carroll School students will receive an email called This Week in, C C this Week in CSOM. It comes out, it's also posted on the, on the internet for parents if they wanna partake in it and, and coach their kids along, but it has so many events. Just this past week, even virtually, we had the Shea Center running their accelerator competition. And you had like Doug Flutie and Dean Sullivan saying, you know, go Eagles. And in there is, is, is uh, in, in very proud moments to be an Eagle. And it, you had 12 students with startups actually show their pitch and what they're, what they're investing in. So we have so much going on. And it really is about students coordinating, running, and helping other students. And, and, and the ethos is something I'm just, I'm, I'm floored by every single year. Ethan's going to talk a little bit about our alumni network because that, that is also one of the most impressive features of the Carroll School. 
Yeah, Amy, I'm blown away by, by our alumni and, and um, not just because you and I are, are among them. Um, you know, if, if we were in a lecture hall right now and I could actually see everybody in, who are participating, I'd ask how many of you are alums of Boston College? And I'm sure that there's some hands that might be raising right now. And so you know, uh, I don't have to tell you this, but BC alumni bleed maroon and gold. They, Boston College is not a four-year school, it's, it's truly a, a 50 or 60-year school that you'd be entering into. Our, our alumni are, are fiercely loyal and dedicated. And you know, we see this in the Carroll School quite a bit. Our, our alumni are constantly helping out our students. And you know, for that reason, I think they're, they're very well thought of. Uh, number six you see here in the Poets and Quants survey asking about the strength of alumni networks. Our alumni are all over the world and you know those that are in the workplace are constantly looking to get new and more eagles into their offices and we'll talk a little bit more about that later but but our alumni are, are such a giving loyal group that um, is really a strength I think of Boston College. Um, you know the the last thing Amy and I want to talk about is this idea of cura personalis and cura personalis is another Jesuit phrase, it, it's Latin for care for the person. And you know, we think of it as care for the whole person. At, at Boston College, I think that you know, we know that, that our students are more than just academic, academically engaged, right? You're whole people, you're, you're growing and developing socially and academically and intellectually and spiritually and psychologically and, and physically. And, and you know you can't separate these things. They're they're all connected, and I can I can honestly say we're we're proud that our office, our undergraduate dean's office, and this is not unique to us. I think it's all over Boston College, but in our office, we want students to know that they will be known and that they will be cared for. All right, no Boston College student is going to ever feel like their their ID number, right? We know them, we get to know them, they get to know us, and, and I think it makes for the incredible community that we have here at Boston College. So, you know, I, I think that it's important to know that at Boston College that you will be known and you will be cared for. Um, and then here, Amy's going to jump into some of the ways that that's exemplified here at the Carroll School. Amy? Yeah, I had mentioned Portico obviously before and kind of the, in the curriculum aspect um, but, but I think the most important aspect of Portico has been this care of the individual. Prior to Portico, we, we just finished our 10th season of Portico. It, it was, um, we got an anonymous donation which was so generous from someone that just said here do something with business ethics. Prior to the advent of Portico, the first business class might have been business statistics in Fulton 511 which had seats 198 people. This has made the Carroll School feel so much smaller. As I mentioned last year, the class of 2023 was 567 people. We have 33 sections of Portico. We have five full-time faculty that are completely dedicated. They teach six classes in the fall and zero in the spring. They are there to, and this is an example of a Portico classroom, they are there to be there for you and guide you along the way and really challenge your assumptions and, and, and kind of really unpack the tensions in a very discussion-based, reflective format. And I think um, we're just so proud. If you do come to Boston College, as I mentioned, the Portico faculty will be Zooming with you with registration, well, excuse me, with advising in June. They'll have two Zoom sessions and then we'll do the registration and then your Portico faculty will walk you through individually with your schedule in July. Then if, you, if we open, which we are all hoping and expecting to open in August, we start before classes even start with a portico excursion. Your teaching assistants will take you into Boston where you'll meet your portico faculty member at a de destination. I was at a co-op coffee and we talked about co-ops and, and um, fair trade and issues like that at a co coffee place in Boston last year. And the portico faculty are assembled all around Boston. And that happens prior to even classes starting. And so we, we walk into class on August 31st, we know you, we know who you are a little bit, we know your name, we've spent time with you in the summer. And it just, it just, it makes everyone take a deep breath and relax a little bit. And as I mentioned, um, the Monday night Portico plenary session, 
in August 31st this year, we're going to ask that everyone read a book called Thirst, which is about charity water, but it's also about like reflection and, and a life of living. And we're going to have Matt and Sarah Hasselbeck, who have um, taken their family to build wells of, in water in Malawi, come and talk about our obligation as Jesuit business students to give back. So it's a really great way to kind of set the tone for Portico. Um, so that's to talk about advising. I mentioned your Portico instructor is your advisor. So you'll meet this summer to plan your fall schedule. We'll be having you in class in November when we do your spring schedule. And then what, what the five faculty and myself have been doing the last two weeks is meeting on Zoom with every single student that we have. And we did their schedule the 14th and 15th for sophomore year. So three of your eight semesters will be planned with your Portico faculty member. Then after that, Ethan, Dean Sullivan runs professional advisors. There's three full-time professional advisors and it's kind of divided up by alphabet as well as you'll have a faculty advisor and we try to pair you in the sophomore year with a, a, an area of interest. Like if you declare finance, we try to pair you with a finance faculty member that you might have as well as we have a whole staff of career coaching. Um, there's a, he's, Ethan's going to get into it in a minute, career accelerator, but just know that Fulton 315, the Dean's office has three full-time academic advisors, Dean Sullivan, who is a servant leader in and of himself, three full-time career coaches, and just people that care so much about you. So each year and step along the way, there'll be people that, as, as Ethan mentioned, that know you and that you're not a number. I'm gonna pass to Ethan, talk about something at Boston College that's very important as far as career personnelists, retreats. Yeah, I, I think this is something that, you know, we, um, we don't have to tell students to sign up for, for retreats at Boston College. They go. Um, I, I think the number is something like 82% of Boston College students go on at least one retreat over their four years at BC. And I'm, I'm very proud that that number is exactly the same for Carroll School students. There, there's not this other experience. I think Carroll School students are truly Boston College students. You know, when I sometimes joke, when you go to the football games, no one's sitting in the crowd yelling out, we are CSOM, it's we are BC. And, and the Carroll School students first and foremost are BC students, they're taking full advantage of all of the extracurricular activities, including retreats. Um, here are three of the more popular, or, or four actually of the more popular retreats. Uh, 48 hours is specifically for freshmen, as is Freshman League and Ascend. Um, half time and, and Kairos are retreats for upper class students. And then the service trips, you know, one way that our students grow and learn about themselves in the world is through the various service trips that our students go on. So this is not um, something that Carroll School students don't do. They're fully integrated in all the best that BC has to offer. So one last thing that I want to talk about with Cura Personalis is, as Amy mentioned earlier, Career Accelerator. And Career Accelerator was developed about five years ago, and partly it was in reaction to um, timelines. All right, the recruiting timelines for internships have gotten earlier and earlier. The, the key internship is really that junior year internship. That's still the internship that tends to be a tryout, right? You, you'll do your junior year internship, and oftentimes at the end of that summer, you'll leave with a job offer, with a full time job offer. And so, you know, while some students will do internships after freshman year and after sophomore year, really what we're gearing up for is that junior year internship. And so Career Accelerator was started because a lot of those junior year internships are, are now selected in the sophomore year. So our students in many cases know what they're going to do the summer after junior year before they even know what they're going to do the summer after sophomore year. And it's a, it's a crazy kind of experience, but, um, but we want to make sure that our students are competitive so that they're getting these internships at the great places they want to work. So, so Career Accelerator really, I think, looks at, um, you know, Amy, can you just throw it back to that one second? Yeah, it, it's really looking at some soft skills and hard skills, right? You'll get some, some hard schools and technology, but you'll get the soft skills of how to interview and how to put your resume together and, and how to use LinkedIn and build your profile. And then, you know, the alumni that I mentioned before, this is a really concrete way to, to talk about our alumni. When we started Career Accelerator, we wanted to build in some, some coaches, some alumni who could coach students in the various industries. 
And we wanted to get, we, we hope to get 80 or 90 alumni that signed up for this. So we threw an email out to our alumni and um, within days we had over 400 volunteers and they're in all sorts of different industries with all sorts of different experience. And they work with the students in the course to do, you know, whether it's kind of informational chats about what's it like to work at a bank, what's it like to work as a digital marketer, um, but then some will also do mock interviews. The folks who are our Eagle experts, we call them, that actually interview for their company, they volunteer to do those same exact interviews for the students in the Career Accelerator class. So when the time comes to have those job interviews, our students are ready. They're, they're, there's tons of resources and they are ready. And they do well, as I said before, the um, class of 2019, you know, 94% of them were, were employed, you know, within a couple of months at graduation. On average, they made about $65,000 starting salary. And, you know, it varies a little bit from industry to industry. Finance and consulting tend to pay the highest. Um, and then there's a sampling of some of the great companies where our students go to work after BC. So, you know, we are very proud of the success of our students. Again, they want to do well and do good, right? They want to get those jobs at those places, but they also want to contribute to society. And so we're very proud that they are our students and hopefully many of you will become Carroll School students and Boston College students very soon as well. Um, so that's all we have for you. I'm sure you have some questions for us. Cindy, we'll, we'll turn it over to you to moderate some questions. We're ready. Thank you so much, Ethan and Amy, for all of the fantastic information you have shared. And everyone, thank you for submitting your questions. We have a couple of questions that have come through about selecting concentrations and when does that happen exactly. Um, and then the second part of this question is in regards to uh, academic advising that is available for students who want to do the concentrations, but maybe also study another things, uh, other things outside of CSOM. Great question. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll take the at least the first part, Ethan. If you, sure. But um, one one thing um, that that um, the, the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences has done is eliminated like majors when you come in because of the, they want people to be uncertain. That you can declare your concentration at any point, and it literally is giving your Eagle ID to an administrative assistant, and they can change it. So it can be done at any point. I would say that most students have it somewhat figured out by by midway junior year. Again, a concentration is only four or five classes. So let's say you took operations management in the spring of your junior year and loved it, you could still complete that concentration because it's two classes in the fall of your senior year and two classes in the spring of your senior year. So there's no stress or hurry to the concentration. Um, and, and, and even picking up, you see a lot of students pick up a, a co-concentration or a second concentration, even as late as junior spring. As far as advising outside, we really, there's an academic advising center, but if it's, if someone's interested in pre-med or something outside, we, we, we stress them going directly to the pre-med department to get the best advising as far as courses and preparation for something like medical school or dental school, or if they're interested in environmental science, we have, we have contacts in each of the departments that's, that are willing to, they, they hold information sessions and are willing to sit down and help our students um, we, we know generally the information, but it's really important to go directly to the department to get the best advice. Great. So for those of you who are asking, as Amy just said, there's a lot of flexibility across divisions, especially uh, within the interdisciplinary curriculum that we have at BC. And I know, Amy, you were talking about pre-health and pre-med pre and those were, uh, and pre-law as well. Those were some of the questions that were coming through um, during the, the Q&A. Now, there's another question coming through regarding field experiences outside of the classroom. Let's start talking about studying abroad. Are there opportunities for students to study abroad? And um, which are some popular destinations? Sure. So, Cindy, there are tons of opportunities. Um, there are 60 Boston College programs all over the world. And a lot of our students do that. On average, about 40% of the Carroll School studies abroad um, for a semester or in some cases a full year. There's, I, I would say, you know, one question we get sometimes is, do we have to go to a business school abroad? And the answer is no. Some of our students want to study art in Florence, right? 
or they might want to go to the Asade in Barcelona and study business there. But some of our students say, you know, the Carroll School has some of the best business classes in the world. I'm going to take my business classes there and I'm going to go abroad to take language classes and culture classes and literature classes. So it's really up to the student. I think what we advise is to narrow in on a geographical location. You know, do you want to be in China? Do you want to be in Hong Kong? Do you want to be in Europe? Um, where in the world do you want to be? And, and then you can look at what programs BC offers in those locations. And they don't have to be business schools abroad. Again, you'll, you'll get some good advising to prepare you to, to take the classes you need to take to graduate. Great. And continuing with this conversation about field experiences outside of the classroom, can you talk a little bit more about the internship opportunities that are available for our students and some popular companies that come to recruit at BC? Sure. Yeah. Um, so all of the companies, all the bulge bracket banks, all the big four accounting firms, um, a lot of the management consulting firms, you know, they're all coming to BC. Uh, marketing, you know, consumer product groups, they're all coming to BC. I think there are, last year there were 2,000 different companies that participated in on-campus recruiting. So, you know, lots of opportunities in any industry you can imagine. Uh, we had a slide earlier that that highlighted some of those companies and um, you know some students if there's a place you want to work that's not on the list of on-campus recruiting we'll work with students to try to tap into our alumni base there's a good chance that we have some alumni that we know that are at those places and we'll connect students in that way too so tons of opportunities and and one one final point um cindy because i think you know we're we're situated in Boston. We're, we're very lucky. We have, you know, um, transportation right out at the, at the foothills of our, of our college. One thing that is underutilized for sure is internships in the academic year. They are out there, but it, honestly, it seems to, I, I seem to think that the Boston College students love being on campus so much and or are involved in programs like Pulse where they go into Boston for service. Now, that's not to say that they can't. I know a handful of students that are doing internships while going to school, but um, it is something that is available. And, uh, we just don't see a ton of our students doing it because they love to be on campus or love to be involved in so many different activities. Great, thank you so much for answering that. Um, it seems like we have a couple of, of people who have tuned in and are asking about the Schiller Institute uh, for Integrated Science and Society, and what do you see in terms of collaborating with this institute once it opens? Yeah, uh, great question. We're excited. I look out the window and I can see it, it um, getting you know, built every day. Um, I think one example is we have our Shea Center for Entrepreneurship. That's a program out of the Carroll School they're going to physically be located in the Schiller Institute. So I think that's a good example of where kind of business and engineering, human-centered design can come together. And so, you know, a lot of our students, we, we really like that cross-fertilization. So let's get a biology student in a space with a finance student and a marketing student and a theater student, and let's see what they come up with. Let's see what they can create to help solve some of the world's problems and and, and do well and start a company perhaps, or just learn a little bit more about it. Um, you know, we'll see some courses in design thinking. I think there was a question about minors and opportunities for classes. You know, their, their program, an engineering program for accreditation purposes is a pretty rigid academic program. So, you know, our students wouldn't be able to do the full engineering major because I think it's like 20 classes, right? But you know they're creating some minors for students outside of studying engineering, and and I think there will be some fantastic opportunities, both in the classroom, but also, you know, there's going to be a lot of maker spaces in that building where students can just come together and play with hardware and and dream up ideas, and again that cross fertilization that comes with with um, ideas and, and collaboration. So very excited about Schiller. Great, yeah, we all are, absolutely. Um, in terms of student life within CSAM, can you talk a little bit about, more about the uh, international community of students within CSAM? Sure, so, you know, I, I think we have um, eight to 10% of our students per year are international students. There are lots of cultural clubs. There's a Latin American business club, um, specifically in the Carroll School, but open to all students. 
you know, th there's, there are faculty, I think, if you look especially at our assistant professors, we hire the best faculty and uh, they come from all over the world. So, you know, we have faculty, I think about 40% of our junior faculty of our assistant professors either were, um, either grew up somewhere outside of the United States or attended their, their college or their PhD programs. So we've got a great culture here of people from all over the world uh, collaborating and, you know, I mean, we're in an era of globalization. You have to understand um, things in, in a, a not parochial way, so. And, and just if you are an international student and do come, our, our international office does a wonderful job. They have a peer mentoring program. Going back to men and women for others, every student is paired with someone um, on campus who's a junior or senior and they come back early and they'll meet you, hopefully again, at the end of August before school starts, um, just to make sure you're doing okay and see if you have any questions because there's always the transition and cultural issues that can come up. So again, more people want to help um, than, than, um, than there are slots, and that's also true of the international um, assistants, they're called. Great, thank you both. We also have questions about uh, clubs and organizations within CSAM, if you can talk a little bit more about the involvement that is available. Sure, I'll go back to this slide here. Um, really, the clubs and activities within CSAM and stem from bridging, as I mentioned before, the real world and the academic world, right? You're, you're studying financial accounting, but you don't know what it means to be an auditor or, or and they're asking you on, you know, in your sophomore year to figure out if you want to do audit, tax or advisory, you know, and so the clubs and activities do a great job of coaching and bringing in speakers and running events that help bridge that classroom experience to the real world. Um, and I know like Smart Women Securities, you get a certificate, like there's all these different um, opportunities. Here's, here's a handful. There's a consulting club and they actually go out and do nonprofit consulting. Um, there's a real estate club. There's so many opportunities with the clubs and activities. But again, one message that we do want to stress is that we don't want you just to be narrowly in one of these clubs. We really want you to get involved in one of the 300 clubs at Boston College as well. Um, this, this is great. We, we, you know, it's great for freshmen to go. A lot of them have mentoring programs, but we also want you to go in Appalachia or go on a service trip, as Ethan mentioned, or a retreat, just, just to, again, to develop the whole person. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, now, if we can talk a little more about outcomes. We have a couple of students asking about opportunities after graduating from CSUM, whether it is jobs or um, MBA programs. Perfect. Yeah, most of our students go directly to work um, upon graduating from the Carroll School. Uh, you know, I, I think that the MBAs, the typical MBA trajectory is most good MBA programs want people with on average about five years of work experience. So, you know, the, the type of MBA program our students would want to go to, a Stanford or a Yale or a Harvard or, you know, those caliber of programs that our students would be interested in, um, aren't going to accept people too often right out of the, their undergraduate experience. I think there's also a, a cost issue to it, right? Most of our students do pretty well. So to take time off to go to an MBA, um, maybe, maybe might not mean as much to them. So, you know, we, we don't track what people do five years out in terms of MBAs, but we have very few that go straight onto it. Most go to work and there's another list of, of companies um, that people are going to. Great, so we are almost at time. I know that we have a couple of students who have joined the conversation and they're not majoring in CSAM, but they are coming from the other divisions and are interested yeah. in minoring in CSAM. So maybe if you can just talk a little bit more, Amy and Ethan, I know you mentioned some of the minors available um, earlier on the slides, but just as, a, as a, a way to close today's presentation. Yeah, in 2016, we launched four minors for students outside of the Carroll School. And they were finance and marketing and um, accounting. One accounting track CPA, another accounting track that is geared towards like banking, people interested in banking and consulting. And by 2017, we had the three most popular um, minors in the university. They've been hugely accepted and any student can do them. There's no application process. You just simply declare it, press a button, and, and you're a minor. 
Uh, the minors are six classes. They closely follow our concentrations. So the, the students in the minor are in class with the Carroll School students taught by the Carroll School faculty, integrated there. And again, I think it's another example of that cross fertilization. The only thing, and we mentioned this um, before, is if you are in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, they do have a requirement that 96 of your 120 credits must come from the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. So if you are interested in minoring, um, just know that um, the six classes in the minor will, you know, that's the, that, that will um, cut into that number. Like the, 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 you're going to have to very much plan to make sure that you don't take too many classes outside of the actual minor within the Carroll School. But um, we, our peer advisors, as I mentioned before, that are trained also are running information sessions for the minors and are helping minors with the academic preparation. Wonderful. Ethan, I know that you also wanted to address uh, our students becoming Bloomberg certified. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, there was a question about Bloomberg certification and we do have some terminals on campus. We have machines here in Fulton, our business school building, as well as at the O'Neill Library. So our students can become Bloomberg certified if they wish. Um, this semester, Bloomberg actually went virtual as well and our, all of our students have online access and can complete the certification online as well. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. We are at time right now. So we do want to be mindful of everyone's time uh, constraints. And we want to thank you so much, panelists, for joining us, Amy and Ethan. We're more than welcome to continue to answer any questions that come up along the way. So thank you so much for attending this webinar. If you need further assistance, you can reach out to your admission representative. Our contact information is available through your admitted student portal. And you can also reach out to Ethan and Amy. Their contact information is available on the screen. Now this webinar is recorded, so you'll be able to view it later on as well. And again, we wish you all of the best. Thank you panelists once again for your time. And everyone, please have a, a safe weekend, a good weekend, and we hope to see you on campus soon. Take care. Hope to see you in June and July virtually. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Go Eagles. <laughs> Thank you everyone.